Well, the Eagles continue to talk numbers with Hassan Reddick, and one of Howie's number experts is gone. But how big of a deal is that really? Plus the latest on Justin Simmons and a potential reunion with Vic Fangio. While Nick Sirianni says the birds aren't done beefing up the O-line, as one player in particular has caught Jeff Stoutland's eye. So let's talk about it. But first, let's run it. What's up, guys? So first off, Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox will be throwing out the first pitch at the Phillies game on Saturday, which is obviously really cool and, oddly enough, will be the first time he's done that. I know, kind of crazy seeing that he's been to multiple other sporting events around Philly and partaken in the festivities, yet he's never done the first pitch before. Unfortunately, we may not get to see him better Travis's first attempt from last year, since Kelsey said with the way his elbow is, the throwing is going to be all on Fletch. The other thing you won't see if you're out of market and don't have a Peacock subscription is the Eagles' home away from home opener in Brazil, with the NFL announcing that the Friday night matchup will only be available to watch on the streaming service, as they attempt to make people purchase a subscription to see the Packers or Browns. That's right, just in case you missed it, Packers president Mark Murphy told reporters that the NFL is still deciding between the Packers and Browns for the Eagles' opponent. Two things on that. First, we'll be streaming, so no worries. If you don't have a Peacock subscription, we got you covered. We're going to have the live stream going on during the game. And second, if it's not the Packers, assuming the Packers are playing at the link, then I'm going to be at that game. Although I think I know this answer, but how are you feeling about the mandatory subscription to watch the birds play? Anyway, getting back to Fletch and Kelsey, Saquon Barkley was on the New Heights podcast and had a few things to say about number 91. My rookie year, it was like impressive tackles. I was like down the field and I was like, it's like, there's no reason why a man that big should be able to be at that spot when I'm making, when making that tackle. <laughs> And like I look up and he's like, "Yep, it's me again. I'm gonna be your daddy for the next 12 years." And I'm no, just we like, not. <laughs> and he's like, "I'm gonna be your daddy for the next 12 years." Luckily for Saquon, he doesn't have to worry about that anymore and gets to join the winning side. Despite Giants owner John Mara saying he didn't want to trade the running back even when they had a two and six record because they were still trying to win and hoped New York could re-sign him. Except that's a little hard to do when you don't make Saquon a competing offer or honestly any offer at all. You are not. Serious people. Thankfully, the Giants are not, so their loss is our game. But the hope would be getting a guy like Saquon could entice Jason Kelsey to come back for one final ride. I'm like a kid in a candy store. I'm happy. I got a fresh start. I, I can't wait to meet everybody and just go out there and play ball. Dude, it's going to be so fun to watch. It's going to be so fun to be a part of. It's going to be great. You don't got to watch it, you know. Look, I know. Selfishly, I want Kelsey to come back. And realistically, I don't know that that's going to happen. However, in my mind, the only way that works is let's say that this thing plays out. We're sitting there at what, like 10 and 2 late in the year. Cam Jurgens gets injured, knock on wood. Hopefully that does not happen. But let's say that he does. And Jason's sitting there on the couch going, you know what? I'm still in football shape. The city of Philadelphia is crying out to me to get my help. All right, let's go. Let's give this thing one last run, try to win a Super Bowl. That's really the only way I think this thing works. Yet again, I will say it, I don't think that's realistic. Plus, hearing about all the wear and tear and what it takes for Kelsey to get ready for each game, I don't blame him one bit if he stays away. Honestly, it's sounding more and more like he'll end up broadcasting, with ESPN pursuing Jason Kelsey for their Monday night football pregame spot, citing Robert Griffin III spot is in jeopardy. I mean, I'm a Baylor guy, but I'd much rather listen to Kelsey than RG3. Anyway, moving on, we had a couple number switches to call out with Eli Rick switching to 23 to get away from the horrific 39 he was wearing. As Anthony DeBona assures the jersey switch just about guarantees he'll play better this season. I'm not superstitious, but I'm, I am a little stitious. I like the change. And kudos to long snapper Rick Lovato, who gave up his 45 to take 49 so that Devin White could stick with his original number. Yeah, judging by the mock-ups, that was definitely the right direction to go in. However, on this topic of numbers, the direction of salary cap guru Jake Rosenberg might not be the right direction. After the Inquirer's Jeff McClain broke the news that the Eagles' salary cap executive and Howie Roseman's chief strategist Jake Rosenberg is leaving the birds. In case you're not super familiar with that name, Rosenberg's been a lifelong friend of Howie Roseman since they were in elementary school, with Rosenberg working in bonds and commodities as a trader up until 2012. But after being a part of the Philadelphia front office for 12 years and acting as one of Howie's closest aides, he's leaving all on his own account, saying that he essentially felt like like he's capped out his potential, and while he feels like he's worked for the best general manager in the NFL, he wants to see how he could perform if given the chance, which according to some is a big blow, with Honest NFL suggesting Jake may be the most influential figure in how NFL teams approach their accounting practices that isn't a household name. Since the Eagles pushed their boundaries of structuring contracts and using cash to their advantage while Jake was the go-to guy for all things CBA and the primary liaison between the team and its players' agents. And based on McLean's article and some research and other input, it seems like negotiations 
negotiation space is the area that may be felt the most, with scouts classifying Rosenberg as a fair but tough negotiator. However, let's not act like this is a major loss. Sure, he plays a major role, but there's several other guys in the front office that play a very big part. Plus, even though Howie wishes him well and wishes that he could have kept him while knowing Rosenberg will be successful in his next venture, Rosenberg himself even referenced that he and Howie have been communicating on this for a while. Also, let's not kid ourselves. Jeffrey Lurie knows what he's doing. I mean, he's a successful business person for a reason. He's not walking out there with no contingency plan. Now, fine. Is there a little bit of nepotism at work with Jeffrey Lurie's son, Julian? Maybe, but still, you can't tell me that they haven't planned on this. I mean, this has been the factory for GMs and executives and other members across the league. Oh yeah, another thing, this is the Philadelphia Eagles, so even even if it hurts a little, you're going to have endless amounts of up-and-coming candidates who would gladly sign up to work under Howie Roseman's tutelage. Yes, I said tutelage. Anyway, I obviously don't think it's that big of a deal, but let me know what you guys think about all this in the comments. I'll also bring up the latest on Hassan Reddick with Derek Gunn reporting the Eagles are still deciding what to do with him, as he wants more money and the sides are at a standstill, and Andrew DiCecco stating that the filling is Philly is naturally the best fit based on scheme and system, meaning there's a strong chance Haas returns to play out the remainder of his contract, which is obviously great news, but how about some Justin Simmons talk? Because another day, another dollar that drops from Simmons' leverage on the market, which is why PFF has Justin Simmons' most realistic and best landing spot as Philadelphia, saying basically what we already know, that he's a supreme talent, can be a difference maker and automatically adds to the turnover battle. Although Broncos insider Ben Albright says no. When asked why, thinking the All-Pro and Fangio don't want to reunite. But hang on, I get that something may be to that, with reports of players in Miami hating Fangio's guts or workaholic demands at times. Yet, like y'all know, Simmons was singing Fangio's praises back at the Pro Bowl. And if we rewind even further to when Fangio was fired in Denver, the 30-year-old corner called Fangio a guy that I've always wanted in my corner, and that it's easy to go to work for someone that's as dedicated as he is. But yes, I know sometimes there's political correctness or just saying the right things. However, if he had a little bit of a distaste or dislike for Fangio, he didn't have to go above and beyond and say those things about his former head coach, which is why I will continue to be on standby for if and when we get a reunion between the two. Now, that won't be the only move, though, as Nick Sirianni spoke to the media at the annual NFL meeting, saying he's optimistic about recent signings of guard Matt Hennessy and tackle Darian Kennard, but said more is coming and that the core group will continue to grow, whether that's another free agency move or in the draft. Remember, Sirianni was also not 100% committal about Cam Jurgens automatically getting the center spot. And with right guard being up for grabs, it does make sense for a Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon in the first round. Here's my daily disclaimer that I still want defense at 22. But if you're fine with offense, then O-line does feel like the most realistic option. Since not only would JPJ have versatility, but he's also without a doubt one of the best interior players in the class. Or if you look at tackle, the favorite is unsurprisingly Tyler Guyton from Oklahoma, since he calls Lane Johnson a mentor and a big brother to him. With Lane returning the a favor and referring to the 22-year-old as a freakazoid based on his athletic skills and potential. I mean, honestly, if it were up to Lane, he's already told the Eagles that it's either Guyton or Alabama tackle J.C. Latham. Personally, I don't know if Latham would be available at 22, but we know how he loves his Bama players on offense. And at 6'6", 335 pounds, this dude is another freak. Someone who Lane alluded to being more ready from day one and could even come in and play right guard for a year or two and then slide out to right tackle once the future Hall of Famer leaves. Plus, Latham is only 21, so still tons of time for room and growth which is good because he did rack up 18 penalties over two seasons for the Crimson Tide. But I mean, I think we'd all rather that type of cleanup needed than something lacking athletically. I should also mention Washington's Troy Fatanu, who is definitely another great option, but everything I've seen has him going much further ahead of the other guys I've mentioned, so not sure if Howie would trade up and get him. Although perhaps he will, since not only did the Eagles attend the 6'4", 317-pound, 23-year-old's pro day, but according to Tony Pauline, they also met with him afterward. Oh yeah, and the Inquirer's Devin Jackson reminded that not only is that noteworthy, but Jeff Stoutland was the one running O-line drills at the Combine, with multiple individuals noticing Stout being enamored with Fatanu. He's also the third most athletic tackle in the class, and with NFL draft analyst Lance Zerline's scouting report, you can see why Stout would be impressed, saying Fatanu is a ready-made brawler without an ounce of finesse in his game. Fatanu has starting experience at tackle and guard and is coached well, but he will default to unruly hand fighting when his technique gets away from him. He also talks about playing with average hand placement, but being capable in the run game while possessing active hands and not being afraid to use them. Although on the negative side, he said that he needs to prove he has the leverage and hand quickness to play inside, but all signs point toward him becoming a good starter in a couple years. I mean, I'd probably take my chances knowing that Stoutland, you can go ahead and clean that right up. With that being said, who out of all these options, assuming you have to take O-line at 22, makes the most sense? I don't know, me personally, I'm partial to the Bama O-lineman. I don't know, I may go get a new lawnmower, kind of. Some I've been looking into. Riding? Yeah, zero time. Two weeks later. I got 
got me a mower. Good for Landon. By the way, in case you missed it, the Eagles are keenly interested in the interior O-line, as six of their 13 top 30 visits so far are focused on the offensive line. And Jeff Stoutland was recently at Pitt running drills and getting a look at Matt Goncalves, with the Pitt offensive tackle most likely being an early day three pick based on some mocks. Of course, you also had assistant O-line coach TJ Paganetti working with South Dakota State lineman, most notably Matt McCormick, with the guard testing extremely high on raw athletic score, a Stoutland preference, as he's been predicted somewhere late day two or early day three. Now, on the other side of the ball, the Eagles continue to look at linebacker, with NFL analyst Tony Pauling reporting Philly is showing significant interest in playmaking linebacker Omar Spates, who ran a 4.6240 after measuring 6'1", 225 pounds, while completing 30 reps on the bench press and impressing during drills. As Pauling also said, they believe he could be a promising inside linebacker in a 3-4 alignment. Not sure this dude will get drafted, but still, it's a name to keep an eye on, especially with the undrafted free agents that we know how he loves, so maybe even something after the draft. Speaking of the draft, we got our first mock draft taking place tomorrow during the live stream, the Friday night hangout, so feel free to swing by 9 p.m. Eastern, and I'll catch you then. Until next time, this has been the Philly Special.